Hey, welcome back. It's episode number 28 on the 12th of November, 2020. We've been at this for seven months. It's amazing. And you keep coming back and I keep being here. So I'm grateful for that. Our reservations continue to work. Please keep calling Thursday and Friday at 702-298-0440 between 9 and 3 to make a reservation for the Sunday Masses or the Saturday Night Masses. But if you forget to make the reservation, we're able to write names in at the door and we'll be glad to do that. A reminder that the church doors open about 25 minutes before each Mass, and confessions are heard during those 25 minutes. So should you want to go to confession without making an appointment, please feel free just to come. Come a little bit early for Mass, and about 25 of will be glad to take care of confession as well. Still no word on going back to the Riverside. When they open their showroom, then we will talk to them about going back. They want us back. We want to be back there, but we need to get shows going uh, again here in Laughlin. And the dispensation continues through the end of November from our Bishop, George Leo Thomas, that there is no obligation for Catholics visiting or living in the Diocese of Las Vegas to attend Mass if they feel safer or if they'd just rather just stay away from crowds uh, during this time. I expect that that might be extended, but we'll let you know about that as soon as we get a little closer to the end of the month. I do have a sad announcement to make. We've decided not to have our Christmas party this year. Uh, the restrictions were just a little bit too great. Uh, we would not be allowed more than 200 people. It would not be a straight buffet line. We would have to have a cafeteria type service. We did not want to rule out other people who might want to come. It would be a problem. We would have to raise the price in order uh, to pay for the expenses and to pay for the entertainment. So I think we, it's a good decision. We've decided that we will hold off. We will not have a Christmas party this year, but we will plan on a great one for next year to celebrate the coming back of the Christmas party. And of course, we are planning a dedication for our new building, the Garces Center. That will probably be early in 2021. Again, we're hoping that the diocese and the governor will give us permission to have a larger crowd when we decide to celebrate the opening of our new building. By the way, it is looking amazing, and day by day, as more things are included in the inside, the speaker system has been installed. It really is looking amazing. So we're going to have a great building, and hopefully within a few months, within to 2021, we'll be able to make great great use of a great building. I want to make a first announcement of uh, our Thanksgiving celebration. We will have Mass on Thanksgiving Day, which is Thursday, the 26th of November. It will be an 8 a.m. Mass in the morning. We will not take reservations for it. Rather, we will open the doors 25 minutes before 8, and we'll ask that when you come, we'll take your name and phone number at the door for those attending. But it will be a celebration of Thanksgiving, and we're looking forward forward to that very much. We mailed out a letter uh, to our parishioners this week. Uh, actually, it went out this after, uh, went earlier this week, not uh, before this afternoon, and you should have that in your hands by the time you're watching this show. It uh, gives you a preview of our Christmas schedule. Presuming there's no changes in the state of Nevada or in the Diocese of Las Vegas regarding this COVID virus, that schedule will, will stand. You can read it in the letter or also be in the bulletin for this week. One of our parishioners was traveling and happened to see this amazing owl. It's made out of pumpkins. It's really well done. So I'm glad to show it off. I have the picture here. I made a copy for myself to keep in my office, and I'm very, very glad to get it. Now, we received a number of amazing questions this week, so I'd like to get almost right into them right now. Um, the first one was, I think, something we've covered in an earlier show, but it's worth mentioning again. Why does the priest and a lot of the people make the sign of the cross on the forehead, on the lips, and on the heart before the gospel? 
what's happening with that. And a companion question with that, I believe it was from someone else, uh, but it, it's in the same genre. I remember my mother-in-law beating her chest during the ringing of the bells at the consecration three times. Why is that being done? So let's go back to the, the sign of the cross on the forehead, the lips, and the heart. That's a symbol that the priest does before he reads the gospel, and there's a prayer that goes with it asking for the Lord to be on my mind, on my lips, and in my heart as I proclaim the holy gospel. If the deacon is going to be reading the gospel, the priest says the prayer and blesses the deacon to read the gospel. May the Lord be on your mind, on your lips, and in your heart as you proclaim his holy gospel. The people kind of watch the priest do that, or the deacon be received the blessing, and, and they kind of adopted it that a lot of people just follow along and do it. They're kind of conditioned that when the priest blesses himself before Mass or at the end of Mass, they follow that motion. And so they follow the motion for there. There's actually nothing in the rubrics for the congregation to be doing that, but it's a wonderful thing. We certainly want the words of the gospel to be on the people's minds, on their lips when they're speaking to one another, and in their hearts when they go forth from the church. So it's kind of an adaptation. They're following the lead of the priest, even though there's no requirement to do so. You might also notice during Mass that many people in the congregation, when the priest is praying the prayers, they join their, they put out their hands in what's called the orans position, the orans position, praying with open and outstretched arms. Again, there's no requirement that the congregation do that, but a lot of people see the priest doing it, and so they imitate it. Now, about beating the breast or beating the chest, <clears throat> It occurs usually in parishes where there, there's the ringing of the bells, and so that kind of signals it. Uh, it's also done by some people if the confiteor is recited at the beginning of the Mass, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Uh, but it's done at the consecration just as a sign of respect, that it's something that really is deeply felt within your heart. And it's usually repeated three times because three is a biblical number for completeness. So if it's through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, I am completely sorry for what I have done wrong. And if it's done at the sign of the bells at the consecration, it's a sign of my heart is feeling this so intensely. Uh, it used to be, I believe, something that began in Italian national parishes and that's where it originally comes from, but it spread to others, and it's uh, and certainly a very expressive gesture of feelings and deep emotions. Uh, nothing in the rubrics about it that it has to be done, but it's done by people because they are feeling something wonderful and powerful during the Mass. Next question is interesting. Why are there two different books used at the Mass? Well, actually, there's more than two that are, that are used, so I'd like to just go over some of them right now and give you an idea of where this all came from. When the Mass was translated into English in the late 1960s, early 1970s, from the Latin, the first book that we began to use was called a Sacramentary. I'm not sure if, you can, if I can get that right up there. The Sacramentary. And it contains all the prayers for the Mass, all the texts for the priest to say. So that's a, a sacramentary. That was replaced by the Roman Missal about 10 years, 11 years ago. And so it's much the same as the sacramentary, but it's the Roman Missal. This happens to be the third edition of the Roman Missal. It contains the prayers for the Mass. It has a lot of newer things that were not in the sacramentary because they had only been written later after English had been used for a few years. So this has a, a more, uh, you might say, modern translation than the sacramentary does, and it certainly has a bit more uh, choices in it. 
So those are the books that the priest would use at Mass. Now, uh, <clears throat> there's a lectionary that is used. My, matter of fact, I think I held up the lectionary uh, by mistake over there. but I did. The lectionary uh, contains the readings for the Mass. Uh, this would be something that the lector would use. It's also something that uh, the priest would be used if he was doing uh, the readings. It contains uh, the first reading, the second reading, and the gospel reading for all the Sundays of the year. It also contains a two-year cycle of readings from the two years, uh, year A and year B, uh, or year one or year two, however you want to classify them, for the daily mass reading. So you would go and you would locate uh, the particular section. Now, in recent years, about the same time that the Roman Missal was used, a larger book was introduced, and this was called the Book of the Gospels. And this was basically introduced so that if there's a procession before Mass, the book of the Gospels would be carried in in procession, placed on the altar or placed on a stand, and then the priest or deacon would read the Gospel from the Gospel book. It has, as you can see, very large print. It's very easy to read. And then it became a custom that if you're going to have the gospel book in church, you should place it somewhere where it would be visible. And so we have a little stand behind the altar where we keep it on display during the week. Uh, it's really the it's a duplication of the gospel readings that are already in the lectionary, but it does make for a nice ceremonial reading of the gospel, a special uh, book that can be used for it. You might also have noticed that after the gospel is read, the priest or deacon will kiss the text of the gospel as a sign of respect that we're actually reading something that is very, very close uh, to the Lord. It contains either his words or the story of his life. If you come to a weekday mass, you may notice that we use this loose leaf folder, and it's basically called a loose leaf lectionary. This contains the same readings as the lectionary, the first reading, the second reading if it's a Sunday, and the gospel, but they're in loose leaf form so that if you wanted to rearrange for a special event, a special ceremony, and you'd like to use the reading from Sunday, you can just place it where it'd be more convenient. It also has them in sequence, so you don't have to go looking for the reading. You just flip to the proper day, and there it is. And that comes out as a subscription. We buy that every couple of months. Uh, it's offered to us the new readings to keep us updated. We got a question about original sin. Uh, original sin is something that goes back to the, to the book of Genesis, and I always think about original sin as something very, very basic uh, to our, our faith, our Judeo-Christian heritage. I think of something funny, too. You may not be aware of it, but there is actually a beverage out there. It's a malt liquor which has kind of an apple flavor, and it's called original sin. I happened to find this many years ago back in New Jersey, and I always kept some in my rectory. And it was kind of a joke that if you came over to visit me, at some point in the conversation, I would say, would you care for something? Would you like to share some original sin with me? And people would usually laugh and find that a joke. But once they tasted it, they found it was pretty good. And I got questions of, well, where did you get that? Can I, can I go out and buy some of that? It is rather delicious. Uh, and a malt beverage, again, with a slight, I like to think, apple flavoring in there. Now, you know the story from Genesis about Adam and Eve, and there was the tree of the knowledge of good or evil in the garden. And they were told by God, you can eat from any tree in the garden of Eden except the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. And so the serpent tempts Eve. Eve goes over to the tree. It looks good. The fruit looks good. Most likely it wasn't an apple, but we think of it as an apple because that's an easy fruit for us to visualize. It was a fruit of some sort. And she took it and she ate of it. And then she brought some to Adam and Adam ate of it as well. And so they disobeyed God. So the sin, the original sin, if you will, is disobedience. It's not doing what God had asked. 
And as a result of that, they were put out of the Garden of Eden, uh, and we had to wait for a Redeemer. The original sin is what causes the necessity of Jesus having to come to redeem us. Now, over the years, we wait, we wait for the Redeemer to come. The Redeemer comes, Jesus comes, and the church follows Jesus. The church is something he instituted, and in the church, it's, well, baptism is what takes away original sin. It's something that every human being is born with because of being human, uh, but it's taken away the effects of it uh, because of uh, baptism. Now we find an exception in two cases. Uh, the one case is Mary, uh, and our church has a doctrine called the Immaculate Conception, which we actually celebrate with a special feast day every year on December the 8th. And we honor Mary that by a special privilege of God, because she was going to be the mother of Jesus, who is God, she was preserved from the effects of original sin by a special grace because of her motherhood that was going to take place. And of course, Jesus himself would not have been affected by original sin. But it affects every other human being. And so even though a parent, a mother, a father, or both a mother and a father have been baptized, they're still human. And so in passing on life, to their son or daughter, they're also passing on original sin. Baptism cleansed them of it. In the rite of baptism, if you've been to a baptism uh, recently and you hear it, there's actually a beautiful prayer in which the priest prays that original sin might, might be removed. It's actually mentioned in the rite, and it's taken away uh, from the individual being baptized. That's one of the reasons why the church has long advocated having children baptized soon after birth, that they could be removed from the effects of original, from the power of original sin as soon as is humanly possible. <clears throat> Follow-up question that I got was, well, is there a surefire way to get to heaven? And the quick answer to that is no. Uh, there isn't a surefire way to get to heaven. But there are some helpful hints that kind of can point in the right direction. Uh, one of them would be, you know, obviously being, being trustful of God, that God wants you to go to heaven that this is God's will for human beings, that we end up spending eternity with him. So you want to look for ways that you can comply with the will of God in your life so that that part of his will, you're going to heaven, the real paradise, will take place. Uh, a lot of the saints, if you read the writings of the saints, a lot of the saints speak and write about the importance of placing yourself in the presence of God. Some even go so far as to say, I learned more by sitting in church for a half an hour, just being in the presence of Jesus in the tabernacle, than I ever learned from any of my classes, even religious classes, theology classes. It was more important to just put yourself and keep yourself in the presence of God. I know there are some jokes about saying, you know, why is there only a stairway to heaven, but there's a highway to hell? Does that indicate anything about the numbers of people? And it's interesting I, to point out from our reading and from our scriptures and from our, our books, the Catholic Church has said many people are in heaven. We call them saints. Some of them we canonize and we say we believe officially that this man or this woman is now in heaven with God. We believe that our relatives and friends and neighbors who die, who have lived good lives, go to heaven eventually. We might not know exactly when, so we could say, well, we know they're there now for sure, but we, we generally believe that that's where they're heading because that's the will of God for them. The Catholic Church has never said, and I repeat that, never said that anyone is in hell except for Satan, the devil. There's never been any human being, no matter how bad he or she might have been perceived to be, that the church has officially said ended up in hell. 
Jesus makes reference to, to hell in some of his parables as a possible place where people could end up. He mentioned, but there's no person who has ever been assigned there. So I, I tend to believe that the population of hell is very small in comparison with the population of heaven. But we really don't have any list of numbers, so we, we don't really, really know that. Another question we got was, what about the burial shroud of Jesus, the cloth that was wrapped around him in the tomb? And that's known as the Shroud of Turin, the Shroud of Turin, the burial cloth of Jesus. It is mentioned in the Gospels, and so we know it, it, it existed. It was a real thing. It has a long and circuitous history of how it ended up at some point in Turin, Italy. Uh, there's a beautiful uh, description of it, and you could look at pictures of it. It actually exists. There is some controversy over whether this, what exists in the cathedral in Turin, is actually the shroud that Jesus was wrapped in, or is it just something like the shroud that Jesus is wrapped in, was wrapped in. But many people believe that it really is the burial cloth of Jesus. And so there's a, a bunch of a devotion that has developed around the Shroud of Turin. Here in Laughlin, we're very fortunate. One of our snowbirds who comes to visit us from Ohio, Dr. Stanley Kasebeer, is somewhat of an expert on the Shroud. And he gives a very interesting and very beautiful talk about the history of the Shroud. And he usually visits visits us during the winter months. So we're looking forward to him coming back this year. And in view of the question, rather than me trying to come up with all of the details for you, I think I'm going to wait and I'll either have a public time when we could have, hear him in church, or, or maybe we'll do that. And in addition, have him come on as a guest on the show and speak about it here. The Shroud of Turin falls into a category of something that we'll talk about in another show, but it's the category of relics, things that remain to us that someone who is very holy has used, whether it be a piece of clothing from one of the saints, whether it be a relic of the true cross of Jesus, whether it be something that falls in that category. And over the centuries, there have been many, many uh, stories of various relics. Uh, I have a few, and I will bring them in to, to show during one of the next upcoming shows, so we can talk a little bit about more about having something that belonged to a saint. I think we all know how comforting it is when we have something that belonged to someone we love who has died, and we cherish that item. Relics fall into that same category in the realm of saints, that it's, it's beautiful to have something that once belonged or was connected to or even touched to uh, a, a saint that we revere in our lives. But we will do more about relics uh, later on. I decided that I would like to say something today about hats. Now, most of you, if you look at any picture of me around, you have never seen me in a hat. I very rarely wear them. I don't find hats particularly comfortable. But for some reason over the years, I have accumulated a large number of hats. People give them to me, I see them, I go out and buy it, uh, whatever the reason, and I have them. I don't wear them occasion uh, uh, that much, but I, I have them. And I thought I would just show off some of the hats that I have and let you enjoy some of the fun of it. This is kind of like a fun part of the show. Most of you are familiar <clears throat> with having seen this in older pictures of priests. Obviously, it would not be worn with a star-studded jacket like this, but it's called a Beretta, B-I-R-E-T-T-A. If you spell it B-E-R-E-T-T-A, it describes a gun. Uh, this is not a gun. But it's a three-cornered, uh, well, four-cornered hat, but a three-pivot hat with a pom-pom, a black pom-pom on the center of it. This was worn by priests, but they were outside. If they were walking along, it goes along with the cassock, the long black robe. It was, at one point in many, for many years, worn by the priests coming in to say Mass, 
and then when he was leaving from Mass, so it would be removed by the priest and by the server of the Mass and put aside before Mass began and then given back to the priest to put on and walk out of the church after Mass had begun. And one of these flaps is obviously used for taking it on or off. This, by the way, is my Beretta from when I was in the seminary. Uh, black pom-pom indicates that you're a seminarian or a priest, if it were a red pom-pom, it would indicate that you were a Monsignor. Uh, and if it were a red hat, it would indicate that you were a bishop. That's a little bit different from the bishop's mitre, what I called on Sunday the funny hat, the kind of pointed structure that the bishop wore for uh, very special ceremonies uh, of the liturgy. Now, mitre is not worn for anything but uh, services of the church. It's not worn when you go downtown or when you're going out in the car. It's worn for church services. This is an example of what's called a zucchetto. Uh, you might have seen these. Uh, if you were Jewish, it's a yarmulke. Uh, the idea that uh, a man's head should be covered. Um, it goes underneath uh, a bishop's mitre, so if the bishop is saying confirmation, perhaps, he would have one of these under his head. Now, if you might recall a few shows ago, we mentioned the ritual called tonsure, in which the hair of the back of the head was snipped as your way to becoming a cleric, eventually a priest uh, of the Catholic Church. Well, at one time, that tonsure was not only cut, but it was maintained. And so you would have a, a bald spot, actually a religious bald spot in the back of your head. And so the zucchetto was kept on there and it went over your bald spot. I have no interest in wearing a zucchetto, but I have worn it when I visited Israel. Uh, it was required going into some places that you would have a yarmulke on, and so they would have one available for you to borrow as you went into the, the Jewish uh, synagogues or temples in Israel. I couldn't resist one. This is one I got. Uh, it's called my hippie hat. And you have some long hairs, which I've never had in my life. Uh, kind of interesting for people to look at you, and the hair actually does sort of match. It's a little bit darker than the hair I have, uh, and kind of interesting to wear, but it's my, my hippie hat. I, of course, have an owl hat. I have a whole collection of owl hats, so if you see a hat with an owl on it, chances are you might wear it when I'm out walking sometime, uh, but I, I don't wear it terribly often, but I do like the owl decals that are on it. And somebody in the parish gave me a bear hat. Um, I think I would look probably funny walking around with this on, but the coolness that we've had the past couple of days makes this somewhat appealing that I would want to have it on. I have to show you this one. This was actually a, a gift from Deacon Richard. Uh, it's not exactly a magician's hat, but it does sort of have the bunny look to the top of it over there. And I don't wear this, but I do keep it on display at my house. It's kind of a nice remembrance, uh, the Mad Hatter look. And we'll end with this one. This is called a Capello Romano. We'll pull it down, and oh, I can't get that in. I'll, I'll put those inside for me. This would be the type of hat that Father Garces would have worn while he was exploring our area and the American Southwest. It was worn by the Franciscan missionaries when they came to the United States. And it would be generally tied around. Sometimes it had tassels hanging around the side. More often it was a very simple thing. There are copies of these in white, so it's thought that the missionaries perhaps wore a white hat sometimes in the heat of summer. But more often it was the black and then there's eventually a brown one of these but the capello romano would be a, a what i call a father garces hat uh it's what he would have worn as he traveled through our area 
that's a, a little view of some hats. I do have some from various sports teams, too. Uh, I'll show you those at a, a later date. The final question for today came from one of our viewers out in Milwaukee, Joe Terrian. There is an, an acclamation at Mass, we sometimes say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. What do we believe about the second coming of Christ? When do we believe it's going to happen? What, what's in the scriptures about it? The book of Revelation, among others in the Bible, speaks about the second coming. The Greek term for it is the parousia, the end times, the coming of Christ uh, to come back to earth again. And to, depending on how you read the book of Revelation and various Old Testament books, to reign on earth for a number of years and then to take up those remaining on earth with him to eternity. The belief in the second coming is something that has goes through periods in the church. In the early church, it was felt that Christ was coming back really soon, like any day now, within a matter of months over there. So the apostles would have expected Jesus to return more, more earlier than many people later on felt. As the church went on through the years, more and more people felt that the second coming was connected more with the end of the world, and that might be centuries away, so we don't know for sure when it would be. And I think the, the basic reading of the church of those things would be is, yes, at some point in time, Jesus is coming back. And yes, at some point in time, the world will end and it'll be heaven and hell. The earth uh, will not exist anymore. But we don't know when that time will come. In fact, the gospel is very specific. You know neither the day nor the hour. And as the church grew more and more, it decided, or it declared more in its prayers even, that we believe in the second coming, but we also believe we don't know when it is going to happen. Will it be in our lifetime? Will it be at some future lifetime? And the idea was we should always be prepared. If you were to visit my house on my refrigerator, I have a little refrigerator magnet, and it's a picture of Jesus, and the caption on it says, Jesus is coming. Look busy. I've always liked that statement, and I try to follow it. It's time for our owl to come down. And Pasco is with us as always, and as always, he brings us a message. And... I thought we would go for something beautiful today. The message is Stella Morris Regina Angelorum. Stella Morris Regina Angelorum. These are two titles of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She's the Stella Morris, the star of the sea, and she's the Regina Angelorum, the queen of the angels. Those are just two of maybe a hundred titles that exist in various books over the centuries for the Blessed Virgin Mary. Someday we might devote a whole show to the titles of Mary. But for today, just those two, the Stella Maris, she is the star of the sea, and Regina Angelorum, the queen of the angels, ways to honor our Blessed Mother. Thanks again for joining us. God love you and have an awesome weekend.